Welcome to Understanding Climate with Professor Monks. Today's topic, radiative forcing. We've learned about how our climate can be changed by a variety of factors. These include changes in incoming solar radiation, changes in the Earth's albedo, and changes in greenhouse gas concentrations. So how do they all add up? To understand this, we need to understand the concept of radiative forcing. Radiative forcing is the amount by which a factor changes the balance between incoming and outgoing radiation. A positive radiative forcing means that more energy is coming in than going out, which will increase the Earth's overall temperature. That can be caused either by increasing the incoming energy, or by decreasing the outgoing energy, or both. A negative radiative forcing means more energy is going out than coming in, which will decrease the Earth's overall temperature. In the long run, that change in temperature will change the amount of outgoing energy until the Earth's energy budget is back in balance again. Radiative forcing is measured in watts per meter squared. A watt is equivalent to a flow of one joule of energy per second. In other words, a radiative forcing of one watt per meter squared means that every square meter of the Earth is receiving an extra joule of energy every second on average. A joule is about the amount of energy it takes to lift a dish of dry kibble off the floor. Well, depending on how hungry Professor Monks is. When calculating the radiative forcing of some event or process, it's important to consider both its direct effects as well as any indirect effects created by feedbacks. A negative feedback may neutralize much of the radiative forcing of a process, while a positive feedback will amplify it. Here's an example of a positive feedback for carbon dioxide. When we add CO2 to the atmosphere, it enhances the greenhouse effect, causing a rise in temperature. This shows that CO2 on its own has a positive radiative forcing. The higher temperature leads to more evaporation of water. Remember that we learned that warmer air can hold more water vapor. Now, water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. So now we have the enhanced greenhouse effect from the CO2 and from the water vapor, causing the temperature to rise even more. A related feedback in the climate system comes from the formation of clouds. When that warm air full of water vapor rises in the atmosphere, it's going to cool off. And eventually, it may cool enough that it can't hold all that moisture anymore, and so the water will condense out into clouds. And clouds have two contradictory feedbacks. Very small water droplets tend to scatter sunlight, increasing the Earth's albedo. This has a cooling effect. But larger water droplets tend to absorb long-wave radiation, enhancing the radiative forcing and warming the Earth. The balance between these two cloud feedbacks is an important area of research for climate scientists. Here we see a chart compiled by the IPCC adding up various radiative forcings relevant to our climate. Bars going to the right are positive forcings, and bars going to the left are negative forcings. The bar shows our best estimate of the size of the forcing, while the bracket around it shows a range of uncertainty. The real amount is probably close to the middle, but could be anywhere along the bracket. The largest bar is for anthropogenic CO2. Remember that while CO2 is a relatively weak greenhouse gas on a pound-for-pound -pound basis, it's also by far the most common one being produced by human activity. Methane and nitrous oxide are also important positive forcings. Some other gases also have small forcings that need to be accounted for. Human activity is also producing various sorts of aerosols, tiny particles in the atmosphere that scatter incoming sunlight, increasing our albedo, and thus cooling the planet. Remember that we learned that efforts to reduce sulfur emissions in order to control acid rain also reduce the cooling effect of these emissions. The biggest uncertainty is the effect of aerosols on cloud formation. Aerosol particles encourage the condensation of tiny water droplets on clouds, which increases our albedo and cools the Earth. We know that this cloud formation will be a net negative forcing, but it could be either a very small one or a very big one. Land use change also alters the albedo of the Earth's surface. Overall, anthropogenic land use change tends to increase the albedo, since, for example, a new pasture is lighter in color than the dense forest that it replaced. These albedo changes are relatively small, but they do serve to cool the Earth a bit. Finally, there's one significant natural forcing, changes in the intensity of solar radiation. The sun has gotten just a bit brighter overall since the pre-industrial era, 
Remember that there are lots of other natural processes happening on Earth, but they're generally in balance. For example, volcanic eruptions add CO2 to the atmosphere, but they're ha happening at roughly the same rate as they always have, and they're balanced by the deposition of carbon into limestone and other rocks. They aren't creating forcings that change the Earth's overall temperature. When we add all these forcings up, we find that the net forcing was a positive 2.29 watts per meter squared in 2011, the time of the latest IPCC report, although there's a good bit of uncertainty in that estimate. That means that, on average, every square meter of the Earth is getting an extra 2 joules of energy every second. So how much will this energy warm up the Earth? We measure this by the climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is the amount of warming that we expect from a given amount of forcing. Typically, we talk about climate sensitivity in terms of the amount of warming from doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. The most common estimate is about 3 degrees Celsius. That is, a doubling of CO2 with no other forcings would cause a rise in the Earth's temperature of about 3 degrees. It's important to note that climate sensitivity is based on the new equilibrium temperature after the system gets back into balance again. So we can't just determine the climate sensitivity by looking at the measured rise in temperature so far. Even if we stopped all new anthropogenic forcings, our climate system would take many years to reach equilibrium. That's called our global warming commitment, the amount of additional warming that we will see in the future from the greenhouse gases that we've already put into the atmosphere.